All right, small bowel pathologies. First of all, what is the function of the small bowel? The function is digestion and absorption of nutrients. So the things, the I like to think about some various set of symptoms with pathology of the small bowel. If you have problems with digestion and absorption, then I want to think about are there any nutrient deficiencies? You also want to think about is there diarrhea or constipation because um, poop has to go through the small bowel and you can have too much water or too much malabsorption leading to the diarrhea or you can also have constipation due to blockage. And then the finally, sometimes you can think about will there be any blood in the stool. Alright, so without further ado, let's talk about malabsorption. Basically, this is a problem with absorption of nutrients in the small intestine. And we can substratify this into various three major groups. There can be problems with insufficient digestion. So for example, enzymes or bile acid needed for digestion can't reach the small intestine so that nutrients aren't broken down. If they're not broken down, they're not absorbed. We can also have problems with a problem with the absorption itself. So a defect in the intestinal mucosa impairing the absorption of nutrients from the intestinal lumen. So that food that you ate was digested but even you have all these nutrients now in the lumen, but not, they're not absorbed because there's something wrong with that intestinal wall. And finally, we can have bacterial overgrowth, and then the bacteria eat up all your nutrients, and then so you have um, nutrient deficiencies. We're really going to focus on these insufficient dig digestion, insufficient absorption in the upcoming slides. Now, how will these patients present? I asked you, will there be any nutrient deficiencies? Well, the answer is yes, there will be because obviously this is a malabsorption problem. Will there be diarrhea or constipation? Yes, well the answer is there'll be diarrhea, and you can also have steatorrhea, which is greasy stools. Um, if you're not absorbing, then you have all this, all this extra nutrients in your lumen. You can have um, hyperosmolarity leading to extra water coming in. Uh, if you're not di digesting the fat, then you have the steatorrhea with greasy stools. And then you can also have flatulence, bloating, just various GI symptoms, flatulence, bloating, and abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, just because you're not digesting well. The other thing, you're going to have weight loss because, again, you're not getting your nutrients. So how do we di um, diagnose this? First test you can try is a fecal fat test. You just want to see if there's any fat in the feces. If there is, that means you're not absorbing the fat correctly. There's a problem with malabsorption. Now you still don't, you don't know which problem, there's many different, I already told you there's always insufficient digestion, insufficient absorption. Um, another thing, another test you can do, it's called the D-Xylos test. And you, this will tell you if it's a problem with absorption. What you do is you give them xylose, xylose is basically like glucose, it's a sugar. It's normally secre uh, absorbed and then secreted in the urine. So you give them xylose and you check the urine levels of xylose. What would happen if there was a problem with, if there was... Let's say normal high xylose present in the urine. That means that your absorption is fine. Okay, that means that this patient has malabsorption, but their absorptive function is fine. So then there must be something wrong with their digestion. If there are low levels of xylose in the urine, that means that at least the the absorption problem there's a problem with absorption because it's not getting absorbed, it's not going to the bloodstream, and it's no, not going to the urine. There can also be a problem with digestion, you don't know, but at least there's a problem with absorption. Finally, another test we can do when we talk about this again is the lactose hydrogen breath test for lactose intolerance. And I'll talk about more about that later. So let's talk about malabsorption resulting from insufficient absorption. Thought, remember, what was the problem here? The problem here was something with the problem with the small bowel wall is not absorbing the nutrients that we did break down. So the very first one is called celiac disease, okay, celiac sprue. This is malabsorption arising from an autoimmune mediated damage to the small bowel. So you have damage to the small bowel with impaired absorption and it's due to autoimmune problem. What happens is you, when you consume, this for patients with this disease, when they consume gliadin, this is a protein found in wheat and grains in, in the gluten, in the gluten protein. It triggers an autoimmune response against the gut. Okay, it's gliadin, part of the gluten protein in wheat and grains. And this is associated with HLA-DQ2, HLA-DQ8, where it's like pro food, it's protein food, Dairy Queen also food, that's how you kind of remember it. Clinical features, how does this present? Well, we just talked about 
malabsorptive symptoms. Do you kind of remember what, just in general, what were the malabsorptive symptoms? Remember, remember were there nutrient deficiencies? Yes. Was there diarrhea? Yes. There was steatorrhea. There was also bloating, blah, 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 nausea, vomiting. Other key things is, remember, this is autoimmune, so you're going to see antibodies. And then in the gut, you have IgA antibodies, okay? And then the antibodies will be against transglutaminase, gliadin, and anti endomycio antibodies. These, you actually have to memorize. Fortunately, you know the gliadin is part of the patho pathophysiology. Transglutaminase and endomycio antibodies are also seen in celiac disease. The other key thing is what you're going to see on in small intestinal biopsy. There's three key features you're going to see. You're going to see blunted villi. As you can see, it's very blunted, very flat. You're going to see intraepithelial uh, lymphocytes. Again, this is autoimmune. There's an inflammatory reaction with lymphocytes coming in. So there's a lot of these blue dots here. That's intraepithelial lymphocytes. And then you're going to see crypt hyperplasia. So you see these, they're going to be enlarged. These are the three features, key features on biopsy that you're going to see. Please be able to identify this, and then you will have to know that these are um, features of celiac disease. So there's the antibodies. Which antibodies were they? Antitransglutaminase, antigliadin, and anti endomycial antibodies. And what were the features on small intestinal biopsy? Blunted villi, intraepithelial lymphocytes, and crypt hyperplasia. The, the way you treat this is you just avoid the trigger. Okay, simple as that. Avoid gluten, gluten-free diet. Next one is tropical sprue. Notice it's the same, it's also called sprue, like celiac sprue, so it's pretty much the same thing. The only difference is mediated by an unknown organism, usually found in the tropical region. Okay. The other thing you can see is you can often see megaloblastic anemia. Again, that's the anemia due to impaired folate or vitamin B12 absorption. The treatment here is some organisms, so you, just, you give them antibiotics, so hopefully it goes away. Next is Whipple disease. Again, this is we're still on the malabsorption from insufficient absorption. The problems with the wall of the intestinal wall and absorption. So this is an infectious disease caused by Tropharema whipplei, hence the Whipple disease, and affects the joints, the neuro central nervous system, and the small intestine. Okay, so it can have have uh, symptoms with the joints, arthropathy. It can have central nervous system symptoms, and then you can have malabsorption in the small intestine. The other thing to note is that when you do histology, when you take a biopsy, what you're going to see are PSA, PAS positive foamy macrophages in the lamina propria and histology. And the way I remember that, first of all, is that there's foamy whip pasta. So this is pasta with some foam on it. So that's foamy whip pasta for Whipple disease. And the reason why you have foamy macrophages is that Tropharema whipelli is an intracellular bacteria. It proliferates within the macrophages in the tissues in the joint, central nervous system, and small intestine. So intracellular and within macrophages. And because it proliferates, it's going to get more and more, and then you're going to get that foamy appearance of the macrophages. So macrophage, with tropharium, with pele, uh, proliferating, proliferating, proliferating. And now it kind of looks like foam, okay? So that's why you see PS and then PSA, just stains positive for PAS. Next, we just finished talking about problems from, with absorption. Now we're going to talk about malabsorption due to insufficient digestion. So your nutrients aren't being break, broken down. The first reason of this is a pancreatic insufficiency. This means that pancreatic enzymes, remember those are key for digestion, can't reach the small bowel. Um, so the pancreas is normally here and it, like, it has a couple of ducts, connects with the bile ducts, and then enter, empties into the small bowel. Okay, empties into the small bowel. So you can have pan chronic pancreatitis with scarring. You can have cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis with that super thick mucus, so that it's plugging up the ducts. You have thick mucus here, plugging up the ducts. Or you can have a obstructing cancer here, all blocking those ducts, so you can't have digestive enzymes entering the duodenum. So what's going to happen is you're going to get malabsorption of fat and fat-soluble vitamins. So vitamins A, D, E, K. A, D, E, K. The other thing you're going to see is duodenal pH changes. What will the duodenal pH be? Will it be higher or lower than normal if you're not getting pancreatic uh, enzymes into the duodenum? Remember, pancreas secretes bicarbonate, so if you're not having that, pancreatic uh, duodenal pH will be decreased. 
And again, it's due to lack of bicarb from the pancreas. Next one we're going to talk about is lactose intolerance. As you can tell from the name, it's just you can't take lactose. You have problems with that. And that's because normally we have a lactase enzyme that breaks down lactate, lactose correction, into glucose and galactose. If you're missing that, you're going to have problems. And this can either be a missing lactase enzyme, either, either congenital, which is rare, or acquired, which is common. Acquired is usually seen, often seen in Asians and African Americans. And for some reason, they just stop producing the lactase enzyme once they reach adulthood. So they're happily eating ice cream. And then, unfortunately, once they reach adulthood, suddenly they get start having problems eating ice cream. And the problems arise because now you have all this undigested lactose, super osmotic. It's going to be um, in the lumen, lots of lactose in the lumen. So it's going to be cause, cause water to come in to even out the osmolarity. So you're going to get osmotic diarrhea after lactose consumption. The other thing that happens is you get decreased um, stool pH and increased flatulence. And why does this happen? Because now you have all the sugar molecules that's being undigested in your small intestine. And you have all these bacteria here. And bacteria love the sugar molecules. Where they'll do that anaerobic glycolysis. And they're going to make the lactic acid. So lactic acid, oops, excuse me, will cause decreased stool pH. And then they're also going to produce a lot of gas. These bacteria, they eat up all this lactose, they're going to produce a lot of gas and you're going to get flatulence. The key thing to note is that your mucosa in your histology is normal. This is not a problem with the, with the intestinal mucosa. Remember, it's a problem with digestion and you're missing lactase enzymes. Okay, so how do we diagnose this? Remember, what was the test I told you about? There was the lactose hydrogen breath test. And what, how does this work? You give them lactose... Then you measure you, you uh, measure their breath and how, see how much hydrogen is there. And will hydrogen be elevated, normal, or decreased in lactose intolerance? Well, I just told you that bacteria is going to eat up all this lactose. What is this bacteria also going to make? It's going to make a lot of hydrogen. Okay, when it when it does its anaerobic glycolysis, so you're going to see increased hydrogen in uh, if it's positive. Now this is really quick, I, I talk about these malabsorptions of vitamins and things, so I just want to see, um, explain to you very quickly what happens. You can skip ahead if you already know this, but I think this is very useful. So if you're missing vitamin A, what happens? The key one is night blindness. You can also have hyperkeratosis, which leads to, presents as dry scaly skin, okay? If you're missing vitamin A, you get night blindness, and you get dry scaly skin. If you're missing vitamin D, you get basically at low calcium and you're gonna, what you're going to have is you're going to have bone pain, muscle weakness, hypocalcemic tetany. So when calcium you need for muscle contractions, you're going to have muscle weakness. You're going to have bone pain because you're going to get, you're going to try and get calcium out of the bones. And then you're going to have hypocalcemic tetany. Okay, next is vitamin E. What happens to vitamin E is if you lose it, you have increased susceptibility of neuronal and red blood cell membranes to oxidative stress. Okay, they're going to get damaged. And so what's going to happen, if, if you lose damage to the neurons, you're going to ataxia, you're going to impair proprioception and vibratory sense. And in the red blood cells, you're going to get hemolytic anemia. They're going to, your red blood cells are going to lyse and going to break down, and then you're going to have anemia. Vitamin K, what is vitamin K important for? Well, it's a factor for, um, for making your blood, blood, clot, blood clotting factors. If you're missing vitamin E, you're not making your clotting factors, you're going to get poor blood clotting. And you get easy bruising and petechia, which result from the bleeding. It's like small bleeds. Next, iron missing iron folate, vitamin B12. I talked about this a lot. What, what are these necessary for? These are necessary for red blood cell production. So if you're missing them, you get anemia. Remember, what was special with the folate and B12 deficiency anemias? When they cause that megaloblastic anemia with the enlarged red blood cell size. Finally, if you're missing protein, you're just going to get muscle wasting and edema. Again, you need protein to build muscles, and then if you have decreased protein in your blood vessels, then you're going to get um, it's going to get decreased osmolarity, increased uh, decreased oncotic pressure, fluids going to go out to the interstitial space and cause edema. So that is it for our malabsorptions.